breakfast after church today, you might be able to smell the bacon. I think they do that on purpose to make me go faster, but at any rate, um, please stay for breakfast if you're able this morning. In the back of the church, there is a sheet, a half sheet like this, and it has the things that the food pantry is in need of right now. Okay, you can pick one up when you're leaving, um, but there's many things that they are short on, so if you um, would like to, there's a list in the back of the church, or I should bring them to the front of the church so that everybody can get them. But at any rate, please um, make sure you get one of those. Uh, don't forget that we do have a website. It looks wonderful. I have to tell you, I opened it up to see somebody, to show somebody the other day, and there was my face, and it was like, oh gosh, <laughs> I was not expecting that. But it looks wonderful, thanks to Wes for that. Um, but just, if you get a chance, go on there. And if you have any activities that you'd like to do with the church that are coming up, let us know so we can have them put on the website. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you bind us together in love. To learn, to be healed, to grow, to serve. Be with us this day and open our hearts to the amazing opportunities to help others through the gifts that we possess. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, if you're able, and join me in the call to worship. Life can sometimes be very difficult. We look around and wonder where God is. In the midst of our trials and tribulations, God is with us. God surrounds us with love and courage. Come, let us praise God for God's abiding presence. Lord, thank you for always being with us, even when we don't recognize your loving presence. Would you join me in hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
in our opening prayer. We thank you, O Lord, that we are not alone. You watch over us, guide us, and lead us in your righteous pathways. When we stumble and fall, you lift us up and gently place us on that pathway again. When we doubt, you surround us with your mercy and peace, reassuring us of your presence through the love of others and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep our hearts and minds open and ready to serve you, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kyle and Kenny, did you 
start school yet? No? Okay. If you guys are a couple days in, right? Two. Okay. All right. Are you going to go and sit with your parents and grandma? And from Romans. Romans 12, <laughs> verses 1 through 8. Hear now the word of the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercy, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, Though there are many of us, we are one body in Christ, and individually we belong to each other. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached. The leader should lead with passion, and the one showing mercy should be cheerful. Thanks be to God for his holy word. You know, it seems like about a month ago since I was here. And it was only last Sunday, wasn't it? Seven short days ago. But it seems like a much longer time than that. Earl and I have had a little bit of a busy week, but it was all good busy. Last Sunday, as I, I'm sure I mentioned, we were going to a picnic for the mission team that Earl has participated in since 2006. We heard the story. We hear stories that are the same every time the mission team gets together, but that's okay, because I think we need to hear them. And one of the stories that they tell is about the pastor that challenged her congregation. When Katrina struck in 2005, she said to that congregation, and what are you going to do about it? The pastor who preached that sermon, the pastor that got that mission team together and moving, and is still moving today, is a rather unassuming woman whose name is, uh, Diane Prentice, I'm sorry, I was it was completely escaping me for a minute. Her, not a big woman, not somebody that's forceful in their preaching, but Diane challenged those folks at a church outside of Wyalusing, and from that church, the mission team that still continues to do God's work was formed. That's really quite, quite a legacy for her. But the people took that challenge and they ran with it and continue to run with it today. There were 40 people that got together last Sunday. 
people that had been on mission trips, people that maybe were spouses of folks that had been on mission trips. It was a wonderful time, but all because that one woman challenged her congregation, what are you going to do? What change can we make in the world? So this past Tuesday morning, Earl and I got up rather early. Well, you know, you know anything before eight o'clock is too early for me. So we were at the airport around four, and it wasn't PM, it was the four, eight, the four that I don't normally see. We were at the airport, parked our car and got ready to fly to Charlotte to get on another plane where we would fly to Rapid City, South Dakota. In Rapid City, we were meeting some friends, friends that we had made when we were on one of our cruises. They were coming in from California. We got there fairly early. We were able to take a nap, which I was very, very thankful for. And our friends didn't get there until much later that evening, but it was good to see them, good to join together with them again. And the next morning we got up and got on a bus to travel around to see some sights, to see some of the sights in South Dakota. The first stop on our trip was Mount Rushmore. That was what I really wanted to go and see. It was awesome. It was everything I thought it would be. As I think I told Nancy a few minutes ago, the weather was picture perfect. But in my mind, I kept asking why. Why did a man come to South Dakota and put sculptings of four presidents on the side of a mountain. What made him think that? One of the things that we were told was that this was good hard rock, but the sculptor wanted to make a statement and a tribute to democracy. So on the side of that mountain, you see the faces of Washington, Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt and Abe Lincoln, they are there for all the world to see. And there were many people that were there that day. I'll be glad to show you the pictures if you'd like to see them. But that was really what I had gone to see. I, I couldn't believe that I was standing looking at the sculpture on Mount Rushmore. It was an amazing time. And after that, we went and we we visited the Black Hills, we toured through the Black Hills. The bus went through tunnels that I couldn't get my car through, so I'm still not sure how we got the bus through them. And at the, when we would get through the tunnel, he'd say, now look back through the back window of the bus, and guess what you could see? Mount Rushmore. There were at least three tunnels. Three tunnels that you could still see Mount Rushmore. It was, like I said, it was amazing. But what was it that made that man do that? He wanted to, a lasting tribute to these four presidents, to the democracy of the United States. He made a lasting tribute to these men. He pointed it in a certain direction so it would get sun most of the day. They put it on the granite hills of South Dakota because of how hard granite is. And people from all over the world continue to visit that spot. At one of the later stops that day was at Crazy Horse, a monument that is still in construction. I'm trying to remember. I the dimensions of Crazy Horse are just amazing. But we got to see that too, but they're still working on it. All of these things could have warranted more time. I would have loved to have spent more time, but you know, when you're on a bus trip, it's time to go. We don't want to miss lunch. 
But the thing is, that lasting change that that sculptor made is still here for us to see. He had a dream. He had a dream, and he sculpted the faces of the presidents in his workshop, and then they were put onto the, onto the side of the mountain. The nose of George Washington is taller than most men. It's just amazing to see. But what is it about us that's amazing? What can we do in this world that would change the world, that would make people want to come and fill up our pews? What would it be that would make us be a church that welcomes others but expects others to come in our, in our doors? I would suspect if we had a breakfast every morning and you could, or every Sunday, and we could smell bacon throughout the, the service, maybe that would attract some people. We'd have to get the word out. But I don't think we're going to do that. But how can we use, how can we use our gifts, the gifts that God gave us? And you know what? Too many times when I preach a message like this, I'll have people say, well, I really don't have any gifts that I can use. But think about it. Think about what you're passionate about and how can you use that passion for God. In this scripture, Paul said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That must have sounded really, really strange to the people that were living in the first century. For centuries, faithful Jews had thought they were pleasing God by giving a sacrifice. If God was angry, you killed a cow. If you were sorry that you had done something, you might put a lamb on the altar. Paul is now saying to them, enough of the killing. We need to make a difference in this world in a different way. God doesn't want de dead animals. God wants people that are alive. God wants vibrant, joyful people living out their faith in every corner of this world, even in Loyalville, in Dallas, in Sweet Valley, in Harvey's Lake, wherever it is that we are. God wants people, God wants us to live out our faith. Sometimes we punish ourselves and we punish others for their sin. That's not up to us. We don't need to judge anybody. We don't need to criticize anybody and we don't need to condemn anyone. It's been said that the Christian church is the only army in the world that shoots its own wounded. As the scripture goes on, Paul says that God doesn't want the process to end here. Forgiveness is the beginning, and the Christian life is a journey of a thousand baby steps. In other words, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens over a lifetime, and so these are Paul's words. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by God. I have to tell you that I have a closet full of clothes. Probably an awful lot of them have gone out of style. But you know, the clothes that you bought because this was in style, or that length was in style. I'm not going back to the miniskirt. That was, that was a few years ago, and I'm not going there again. I know, you can be glad about that. But we are dictated in what we're wearing by what the world says. When we were in the airport, and I'm not sure which one it was, it doesn't really matter, it was interesting to see the different types of clothing that people had on, the different hairstyles. In a few cases, I saw some young men that were dressed in suits. And boy, that's unusual to see men in suits and ties. And some of these gentlemen were, were young. 
And all I could think to myself was, they're going to a business meeting somewhere. Long gone are the days when people used to dress up to travel. Some of the outfits on the plane were interesting, to say the least. Paul tells us, don't be conformed by this world, but be transformed by God. The words are interesting, aren't they? Conform means to rearrange the shape, the color, the form of something. But in most cases, that's temporary. Now, in the case of something like Mount Rushmore, it's not really temporary. It's been there for a while and probably will continue. But the word transform means to change inside. And Paul's assessment was exactly correct. We spend much of our time and our energy rearranging our lives in order to fit into this world. And we don't spend a lot of our time and energy allowing God to change us at the core. Finally, Paul says that the church is a body and that every person in the body has a vital part to play. No one is more important than another. A doctor isn't more important than a nurse. We are all important and we all, every one of us has gifts to use. But Paul's concept of the church being a body has another feature to it and that is we all, we all have an important job to do. Nobody is less than another person. We all have an important job to do. If Ed decided to play the guitar with only one hand, I think it would sound a little bit different than it does normally. If there was a choir and we lost the tenors, it would sound different. And if the number of people who decided that they were gonna share their offering decided against it one week, the body would be handicapped. Sometimes we fear what our church would look like if more people came in the door. If the church grows, what happens? What happens if the, fills, the pews are more filled? But if we see the church as a body, even if the body grows, Christ will be at the center, and honestly, it will change very little. It might be rearranged. It might look and feel a little bit different, but it will be the same church because it will be comprised of people whose lives have been transformed by Jesus Christ. It is his church, not ours. God is the source of our growth and our change, and God is the purpose of our life together here. May our joy come only in that what God, which God has done, and may God's joy come in our faithful response. Thanks be to God. I would like to read again that same scripture for you, but this is out of a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. So here once again is Romans 12, 1 through 8. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embrace, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us. 
not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of the body, but it, as a chopped off finger or a chopped off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently, excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Let us pray. Almighty God, we all have work to do in your world, and we thank you for the gifts that you have given us. Help us to be aware of those gifts and to use those gifts passionately in your service. Amen. Would you join me now in our affirmation of faith, which is found on page 881 in, in the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I would like you to keep Jean in your prayers as, um, as she's in the hospital and um, having some tests, so please keep Jean in your prayers. And I would like you to keep um, my cousin Art's family in your prayers as Art passed away after a three-year battle with esophageal cancer. Art passed away this, the, this past Wednesday. So if you would please keep his family in your prayers, I would appreciate it. I'm very thankful for safe travel for Barry and Lola and for Earl and I, and for any of the rest of you that have been going anywhere, I'm thankful that you're here. It's good to see Patty and uh, always good to see all of you. Do we have other joys and concerns this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, you've called us to be your church, and we ask for your transforming love that we might be better witnesses for you. Today, we name in our hearts before you people that we love who are dealing with sorrow and illness. Lord, I pray for Jean as she's undergoing tests, and Lord, I just pray that, um, that some answers will be received and Lord, I, I just pray for healing for Jean and, and also for Jim. I just pray for the two of them. And Lord, I pray for I pray for Art's family. I pray for Barb and Kristen and Karen as in the loss of Art. But what a man, what a man he was. And Lord, we know that he is now at peace with you. And we are very, very thankful for that. 
Lord, I pray for people today who feel abandoned and alone, people who might be going to school or maybe have gone to school already. And we also name people in situations that are filled with joy and hope, a new home, the birth of a child, celebrations of special occasions, and sometimes just a beautiful day. We do thank you for the gift of the, the mission team and all that they have done um, over the past 18 years, and I pray, I, I thank you for those friendships that are so valuable. Lord, I, I do thank you for the, the time that was spent together. And Lord, I pray that you will hear the cries of our hearts to you, Lord. Heal and transform our lives, and we ask these things in your name as we pray our prayer of confession. There are far too many times, O oh Lord, when we have neglected or ignored the needs of others because it just was inconvenient for us to help. We backed away with excuses on our lips and indifference in our hearts. Forgive us and set us on the right path of service and compassion. the gifts that we have and the love of Christ, direct our lives in compassionate service to others. In Jesus' name, we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As God has been so gracious to us, let us now share our gifts.
for the hands that have prepared it, the food that will be set in front of us. Lord, we just pray that you will bless it to our bodies and our good. And as we leave this place later, the world awaits the love and the gifts that we all have to offer. Go forth in joy and peace to be God's witnesses today and all of your days. Amen. <laughs>